So good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today, my guest is Ryan J. Melton from One Plan for Retirement. Welcome, Ryan. Kia ora, Deborah. Why Ryan J. Melton? <laughs> why Ryan J. Melton? Yes. yes. Um, because I'm pretentious and I'm stuck up. That's why I put that in there. The, re- the reason Ryan J. Melton is, funnily enough, there's a few hundred Ryan Meltons in the world. Mm-hmm. And I don't like competing um, in a space that I can't win. So I just put a J. So then anytime someone searches my name, all the page one's me. So at least there's not some sort of confusion or because you always get taught in sales to make the clothes as easy as possible. Yeah, fair enough. I just remember seeing the other day on the news, there was a guy who had actually done some SEO work to make sure if you typed in the Auckland's hottest bachelor, mm. he actually came up as number <laughs> one. <laughs> well, that's the two. Yeah. I went back to the pretentious aspects. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, so you obviously are working in retirement. How did you get into that? Uh, I, funnily enough, well, Seven or eight years ago, I think now, I wanted to build a business around emotional success. And then when I started talking to people, the more I got to understand them, the more I realized how much finance plays a part. But I didn't know enough about it to sort of go in that direction. So I had a bit of money from insurance, started running events called Meaningful Money Making for millennials. Yeah. And so I thought I can bring an audience, then I'll attract a, a speaker and that speaker I'll learn from and build a connection. And funnily enough, that happened. Door knocked a few business owners. Um, third one said yes. First two couldn't actually do it. They were the wrong kind of an advisor. And um, when I walked in, the um, receptionist said, oh, no, no, we do retirement planning. We're not going to, we're not going to, he's not going to be interested in that. But I was like, oh, sorry, I'll wait. And then I had a chat to him and then he spoke and uh, he asked me if I've ever thought about working in the industry. And I said, no. And he said, I'll pay for your study um, and you can be a part of it. Now I realize I can do a tangible life coach. You know, I can look at what's important to people in life. I can have those those conversations, be there for them at key life events, but also sort out their money. Um, so now I just think, well, that makes sense. That's the business I want to create. So I've been there for a few years now. And How many years? Three now. Okay. And who's the owner of the business? Greg Moyle. That's right. He appears on your podcast, doesn't he? He does. Yeah. Mr. Moyle is uh, well known. He built his business through accountants and lawyers. Yep. And I'm going different tack with the social media that you're talking about. Mm, Fantastic. Okay. So tell me a little bit about yourself, first of all. What's your kind of professional and personal best you can share with our viewers, listeners? (laughs) Yeah, viewers and listeners. There's a video. There's a video. There's viewers, yeah. (laughs) Yep. Uh, Personal best is a bit of an emotional thing where um, I was in a bit of a tough point. Girlfriend left me for someone else. Um, Moved 200 metres down the road, could see them from my bedroom window. Um, and then a whole lot of other things, like 80% of the staff that were supporting me with the commission only selling at the time mm-hmm. left. So you had no booking appointments. My um, expenses doubled. Uh, so I was crying in between appointments. And then I had no friends because I was new to Auckland. And my only friend left. Um, so I started confiding in this girl. And she was going through a lot, long time friend. And she was overseas. And then she actually, I was going to turn it around. This is a long-winded story. Mm. But... Um, there was a moment where uh, I went on a team run, I was sleeping in my car um, to keep costs down and I had to turn it around with this talk I had to do to a number of people that could be clients at the time I was selling medical medical gear. And at like 2 a.m. in the morning, she started acting funny when I was messaging her and um, she'd actually tried to kill herself. Mm-hmm. And, and I couldn't think of being in a different country. I couldn't think of what to say other than if you actually do that, I'll make sure your parents turn up at the door. And that was the only thing that got her to stop. And then the next day I did a talk and it said the career, but the the personal best is making sure she's still here and she's happy and married and um, having a baby or had a baby. Oh, that's awesome. That's so that's the lovely. personal best. Yep. Um, professional best is like, for me, it's just, you know, having a fear and facing it, you know, like for me, a personal best is every day that I can do that. I mean, there's accolades, you know, like early on my sales career, being able to make $5,000 in a day or um, or like um, make a revolutionary change in a business that makes a, a big impact on people's lives and makes them happy. But for me, it's just the, the every day, you know, any moment where I feel fearful and I f- have doubt and I just incrementally work through it and come out the other end as a personal or professional best for me. Is that how your podcast started? Yeah, no idea. Two years ago, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I sort of paralysis, paralysis by analysis, overthink everything or just do it and wing it. Yep. So I go with the build and wing it. And um, the podcast <laughs> is built up to um, top 100 in New Zealand for business. Excellent. And um, now people call us, which is a rare thing. Yep. Um, so took two years, had $80 a month budget. Yep. And um, now people are calling us and we've built up um, a good portfolio of clients, got a few hundred clients. Um yeah. And tell me, so your podcast is obviously about helping people to live a better financial life. Is that right? It's called the NZ Guide to Financial Freedom. Yeah. But the funniest thing is our ideal clients aren't interested in finance. We want passive investors that just want to live the life they want and not worry about money. Right. So we actually have to get them at a point in time. So what we do is we talk about lifestyle and interesting topics with different speakers. So the number one speaking um, coach in New Zealand or Deborah Chantry, the, the business attraction, so it's business action <laughs> yeah. um, business coach. So we give diversity so we can maintain attention. And then when the tight life event occurs and we've added value and trust, then they reach out. Okay. That was the objective. And finally, after two years, it's worked. That's fantastic. So our listeners tend to be business owners. Um, tell me about the biggest financial challenges that business owners tend to face. Well, it's, it's like... I mean, the cash flow is bread and butter of any organization and a lot of um, business owners are cash flow poor. And also if they're not that, they're either lifestyle asset rich and don't have a means to fund their lifestyle. So by lifestyle asset, I mean the family home, the car, it'll cost them money. Yep. But they don't have a means to replace their income because everything goes into the business. The other thing is they don't think about the exit strategy, how to structure the business, how to have a succession plan. They just, it's kind of like their baby and they can't let it go. Yep. So that would be the biggest thing I see business owners fail at is one, either the structuring of the assets to protect against creditors, because mm -hmm. that's the uncertainty that can come knocking when you least expect. And then also having an investment strategy that's independent from the business. So at least if you can't sell or had enough at some point, you don't need to work because you have to. Okay. Yeah. And so you can work with people. I, I assume the first step is understanding what's important for them. Tell me, take me through the process that you would do when you're working with a, with a client. So it's transferable, like in any sort of, like I call it sales, it's problem solving to me as sales. Um, but like, you've got to understand what's important, their values, their goals, and then also the situation. Because um, we want to look at their liabilities, their lifestyle assets, their investment assets, so you get an understanding of that. Mm -hmm. The next piece is how much is that lifestyle going to cost when they stop paid employment? Yeah. And when would they like to stop paid employment? And then from there, it's looking at the, the, the ticking the boxes, you know, insurance. Do they have the right insurance? Estate planning. Do they have the right structure of the assets? Does the family trust still make sense? Or should they get a family trust? And then the other piece of the pie is um, you've also got the investment structure. So what would they be comfortable with? Yeah. It's one thing to go for highest returns, but it's another thing to actually have something that you're comfortable that will be able to deliver what you want. So then that's the final piece is an investment. So we usually summarize it, product, structure, strategy, product, who's going to deliver it, strategy, how and what do we need to deliver? Mm -hmm. And structure is how can we make sure that the best interest of the people they care about is looked after as well as their own. It's a bit of controversy here. Go on. <laughs> Cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency. Because, of course, a lot of entrepreneurs love to take risks and I've got lots of friends who are investing left, right and centre into cryptocurrency. What's your views on that? Because I read a really interesting article from my friend Sam Stubbs the other day um, and he's definitely not one for it. Love to mm. hear your thoughts. So I, I, I link cryptocurrency sim, akin to the revolution or evolutionary, uh, the technological evolution of the internet. Right. So it's this new technology that's actually remarkable and could make a huge impact on people's lives. So from 2000 to 2003, the internet was becoming a real thing. Yep. And any company that had .com on the end of it was an ex exceptional investment, it was making 20% a week returns. And then by the end of that, it no longer existed. Yep, the bubble. The bubble. So the, the biggest best. challenge with cryptocurrency is who is going to be the leader, what brand is going to take over, and are you going to make a speculative bet where you can lose all your money? Yep. So whether it's crypto, whether it's a direct investment, we don't make speculative investments. We have diversified portfolios that can deliver what they want, and people get fixated on the return, but we say it's the return of your money that mm -hmm. actually matters, what enables you to do. Yeah, that's what I'd say about crypto. It's pretty much what Sam said. He said, you've got to be prepared to lose it all. It's like having a gamble at a casino. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sam well, starts from simplicity, is it? Yes, that's yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Okay, cool. So 
What's the most interesting thing you've seen with a client? Well, for me, it's the fascinating thing is helping people get clear understanding of what they want in life. So there's interesting things that happen, like people skip home, they come in all stressed out, or there's some crazy story where they walked in on a dead body and like that sort of stuff and they got accused of murder. I've seen that. Yeah. Really? Yeah, people tell me everything. Okay, yeah. You're like a hairdresser. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, just understanding people is just fascinating to me and why they do what they do. Um, but yeah, you get the out the box stories and you get all the insider goss and you get, keep it confidential. You say, um, you can say um, hot takes like this on a podcast with no reference or understanding and you're safe. But yep. yeah, that's fine. Okay. And what's the biggest challenge you've had to kind of solve for a client? Well, the biggest thing is when they don't have the means to achieve what they want. So you have to be strategic, you know, right. there's tools you can use like the family home, you can use a reverse mortgage. Mm -hmm. So you can use the, the equity in your home to fund your income and they don't take the money until you sell the house. Yep. So it's good for the older people. Um, the other thing is, um, yeah, that, that's the biggest thing is trying to mediate the difference between what they want and what they have. And you do have challenges. You do have like family members that you've got to think about and they may not think about because a lot of, um, family members put their kids as trustees and beneficiaries where the, as soon as money passes, a certain point comes into it, the kids start acting a little funny. Yeah. And we've had instances where um, a stepmother, new family um, partner passes away. Um, they had their money in a trust um, and they also had it invested. The house was partly owned by the trust. So then you basically had a prison for the step parent and they wanted to, the kids to help them out and the kid says not my mum right okay so it starts to get quite complex yeah so the biggest challenge is getting all people that are involved in a unified vision mm -hmm. and clear transparent communication like a lot of people might use prenup trust and think ahead like that but even then that's not airtight and yep. the best thing you can actually do in a partnership is clear communication and transparency like there's nothing better unfortunately so do you actually help with that with clients? Yeah. We, yeah. It's like, I like referencing sales a lot because of most of my life has been sales, but you don't make, you don't set anything up without the decision makers. So for us, yeah, we can get people over the line. They make decisions, but we're not looking for a transactional relationship. We're looking for long-term. So sure. We may meet, lose people because we're asking, Hey, can all parties be involved? Yep. Um, but in the long run, it's better outcomes for the client. And also it's a, it's a lasting relationship as well now i've heard you use sales a lot and for a lot of us sales is kind of that dirty word and we feel yeah. sort of scared by it um how do you position that what would you say to people who are in business who have a fear of that word sales yeah well i was similar you know like i was actually because i was very fearful of talking to people i created a character to execute on what i needed so when i first came into commission i selling i was like shit i'm petrified of this <laughs> and i also need to deliver so I started, you know, thinking about my body language, my tonality, how to mirror people so they feel more in control, how to, even how to gesture your hand when showing the prices, et cetera. And then, then there's that imposter feeling where you're disingenuous with what your intent is. Mm -hmm. So now for me, it's really what first sell the product to yourself. Yep. And if you can't sell it to yourself, why are you selling it? <laughs> sure. Step one. Yep. <laughs> um, step two is being congruent. Like sometimes actually telling them, something that's against your best interest is actually going to help them across the line. Yeah. So when you're genuinely believe in what you're selling, have good intent, are clear with your intent and your focus is to solve the problem. The close is the only thing that really needs some structure where um, if you're going to close on, it needs to be simple and streamlined. Mm -hmm. So have that part. But the most part is if you're just congruent, honest, forthright, clear in your intent and trying to solve a problem, and then have a structured close, you're not going to have any qualm. You might have the fear of talking to people or asking, but if you put that all on the table. And that's not really sales, right? You're just helping people. Basically. Yeah. Okay. 
Fair enough. But call it sales. Let's not worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't sell. Yeah, every business owner that started probably had to sell unless they had a partner that could do it all for them. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. They're all salesmen. Okay. Don't lie to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so business people, we said before that often they are putting everything back into the business. So on paper, they don't have an awful lot. Could they be sitting there going, well, there's no point in me going and seeing a, a, a person about my retirement because I've got nothing. What would you say to them? Yeah, it's fair. I mean, we have clients that invest millions of dollars. We have clients that have zero and they're starting from nothing. Yep. The bottom line is I've realized people, it's not how much they earn, it's how much they spend. It's their behavior yep. that matters. You earn more, they spend more. I've had couples that earn half a million dollars between them and they're spending every single dollar. Yeah. So if you get a clear- I was there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's the reality. Yep. So that if you actually open that up and mm-hmm. break it down, there is money that is free. Yep. Um, there would be inefficiencies within a business. There's inefficiency with the expenditure. And then if you have a reason to do it, because that's the other fearful thing. People keep their head in the sand because they're not going to have an income and they're worried they're not going to have enough. So they just ignore, ignore until it's too late. Yeah. But even if you're putting <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> yeah. Well, and even if you're um saving a hundred dollars a week, like it can make a significant impact on your life. Mm. And then you got Kiwi Saver for self-employed people, put in a thousand forty-three, you get five hundred and twenty-one free money. Yep. Guaranteed returns. Yes. And then it's compounding. So that can be there for you as well. Yeah. I've got to be more efficient with these answering of questions. It seems like a 10 hour discussion. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's really helpful information. I was actually, I just got my KiwiSaver um, statement the other day. It's amazing um, how much you actually can make on KiwiSaver. Oh, remarkable. And yep. all your employers, yep. employees, you got to get the 3%, 3%. Yeah. Like it's crazy what you can achieve with that. Actually, uh, have you got any examples of businesses you've worked with where they've gone above that 3% or? Yeah, yeah? Or our own. Okay, talk yeah, to me about that. We pay 4%, which isn't remarkable, but that's usually what others would do. Yep. The other thing I'm thinking as well is because our staff are always also a representation of our advice, Yep. you start putting it aside um, their own sort of investment. Mm-hmm. The challenge is like they would have to voluntarily be a part of it because um, you'd have to make it tailored to their risk tolerance and there's compliance things and you have to go through a plan. They might not feel comfortable disclosing it. Yep. But I think that's an important piece, especially in our business, is making sure that our staff are a representation of the advice we give. Fantastic. Okay. And what are the benefits then do you see? So for, as a business owner, for example, um, giving a, a, a employees more than the 3%, what do you think that mm. shows? What's the benefit for you as the business owner? Well, for me, it's like if, if, you, if your objection handle is to decrease the price, they don't see value in it. Yep. So if, the, if there's a business owner that actually wants to do that, I'm happy to come and do a talk workshop um, and actually show the value of it. Yep. Because that would be the first step. They actually need to see the potential implications of that. So maybe it's a calculator or maybe it's talking about their goals. And if you're a good business owner, usually you have people aligned to the vision you're striving to achieve. So you have an understanding of what they want. And then it's just a matter of showing that calculation and the, what the impact that might have. Mm-hmm. But not doing it from a like, hey, look at me. Like I care if I'm doing all this for you. But it's just like, hey, this is what you said you wanted to achieve. I'm happy to contribute this for you and this is the outcome that it has. But if you just do it, they won't, they'll just no value care. It. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Okay, cool. We always ask for three top tips from our guests, right? Three things that the business owners can take away and start using in their business straight away. What would be Ryan J. Melton's top three tips? Mm, tax yourself 10%. Okay. Um, and treat that as treat that as an income, like that as your investment. It's 10%. Yep. Um, the best partnership of investments is KiwiSaver and a managed fund. And a managed fund looks like KiwiSaver, so it balanced growth conservative, yep. except you can access the money. Okay. So you tax yourself 10%, goes in the managed fund, Yep. and then you put in the minimum, 1,043 in KiwiSaver. Okay. And 521 from the government. Yep, yep. Five for, yep that's the one. And, and that, that's tip one. So okay. 10% and growth or balanced fund, depending if it's five-year or 10-year horizon. Mm-hmm. Kiwi saver minimum. Yep. Second step is actually have the conversation with your partner or the significant person in your life. Okay. It might not be comfortable. We call it, um, we talk about, oh, this might cause a domestic when we had in the expenditure requirements. But if you actually sit down and talk about what you're hoping to achieve and what that looks like and how it coincides together, they'll, especially if you've got a partner that spends a lot, Funnily enough, they start changing that narrative. 
So have a conversation. How do you start that conversation? Because my experience of working with entrepreneurs is you've got entrepreneurs who are generally big risk takers, generally kind of, you know, big spenders as well. And often they're balanced with a partner who's quite, quite different, (laughs) risk averse, not big into spending. And so having that conversation initially is going to be tough. How would you suggest that they start that? Well, a good start is, hey, honey, I was just listening to Better Life, Better Business. <laughs> better Business, Better Life, so all way around. Yep. And they're talking about having a clear vision and how that could impact and yada, yada, yada. Yep. The biggest thing, that starts it off. Yep. The biggest thing I've learned is it doesn't matter how you start, you can always react. You can always adapt. Yeah. But the place you're coming from is I care about you. I want to know. Not I have this idea, you need to do this. <laughs> yeah. But if you're like, hey, honey, I've been talking, um, listening to this podcast, they're talking about vision. I'd be curious, like, what was your hope? Like, what would you try to achieve? And then you try and understand that. Yeah. And then once you have so that. So it's goal, similar to a business, really. It's like, what is our vision? What are our shared core yeah. values? Where do we want to be in 10 years' time? Same thing. Yeah. Business is just a projection of a person, anyway. Yeah. All True. those key stakeholders, yada, yada, yada. Mm-hmm. Um, step three uh, structure. So, yeah, so think about estate planning, you know, who's going to get what, how that's going to work, how are you protecting yourself against unexpected with the insurances, yada, yada, yada. So think about structure, get a clear vision from your partner, tax yourself 10%. Those are the three tips. Fantastic. That's really good. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for sharing that. Thanks also for sharing quite um, vulnerably about your personal best. I'm really pleased that you saved your friend's life. I'm sure mm. she is too. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if people want to get in contact with you and have a conversation with you, how do they do that? Well, if you Google Ryan J. Melson, I'm everywhere. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, true. Yeah. yeah. TikTok, Instagram, LinkedIn. I've got a newsletter. There's a book you can get for free. Just email me at ryan at oneplan.co.nz. Actually, it just reminded me of something else. TikTok. Tell us a little bit about TikTok because mm-hmm. I have to say when you first told me you're on TikTok, I thought that's ridiculous. You know, nobody on TikTok is going to be interested in financial planning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So tell us a bit about that and how it's worked for your business. Well, I usually say to be on the right side of today, you need to be on the wrong side of history. Uh, right, wrong. Yeah. If you want to be on the wrong side of today, then you'll be on the right side of history, whatever. You get what I'm trying I, to say. I do, I do, yeah. Yada, yada. So TikTok, heard this all the time. Yep. Biggest revenue generator from social media. No cost, just time. So TikTok, whatever you put on the hook is what you attract. Yep. There's, I don't know, a billion users now. Mm-hmm. So there could be people between 50 and 60 that might be interested in financial planning and an engaging short form content and people just reach out. Hey, I saw your TikTok. I was I was actually thinking, yeah, about my future. What should I do? And then plan, client. So what kind of content do you share on there? Well, the biggest thing I'd say with content, create what you enjoy. Yeah. Because there's going to be points where people aren't interested. There's going to be points where it's hard for you to keep consistent at it. Mm-hmm. That's step one. Step two is, um, is quantity um, will help you create quality. So you can't sit in your boardroom with all your all your different directors and say, hey, this is what I think people will like. Yeah. And then you present it and it's a dud. So if you consistently put out content, you'll actually see what becomes quality. Yeah. Um, so it's about monitoring what you're doing, seeing what, I mean, so doing the stuff that you love, making sure you're having some fun with it for a start because that mm-hmm. becomes authentic and then seeing what actually resonates and refining over time. Is that it? Pretty much. And the thing, there, there's nuances for every social media. So TikTok, it is more representation, more uh, more demographic are in the younger side. Yep. So have have your clothes um, adapt to them. So your one with TikTok, the things the algorithm tries to group it, so it presents it to the right person, mm-hmm. and it also rewards rewatch factor. So shorter videos seem to perform well. The more clearly defined um, content is with the hashtags, with the sounds, and with the content. Yep it will start putting it in front of the right people. And then when they see that, you want to make sure that your um, your clothes or the link that you have in your description relates um, to their pain points for the age demographic. That's what mm. I'd say. Fascinating. That's really yeah. cool. Thank you very much. No worries. Well, again, thanks for coming in. I didn't mention it before, but we've actually been here and done this like a deja vu, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. we, actually, we actually recorded this a couple of months ago and we had some terrible sound issues. So yeah. thanks for taking the time to come back in and do it all over again. No <laughs> I think we've actually learned more second time round. So thank you. Appreciate it. No worries. Yeah, wing it. <laughs> yeah. Every time. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, guys. <laughs>